Oh, Luke, this is the part where I start the podcast again by going, uh, this is a podcast and it, the title is this. And then who are you? Why? We're back with Luke. It's Unfuck the Poor and this is my friend Luke. Hi. And Luke is back. Luke, you've had some time to reflect on our previous episode. Uh, what was what was your what was your takeaway? How did how did you feel about that last episode that we did? I definitely learned a lot about you. Um, and it made me definitely reflect on some of my personal experiences. Um, now that you know I'm a failed contractor, how does that make you feel about me professionally? I wouldn't call you a failed contractor. Not just failed, failed spectacularly. Like oh, yeah. cannot run a business. Uh, you can run a business. You just into dis- the ground. I was about to say you decided to go down in flames, <laughs> <laughs> triumphantly. <laughs> you you chose this path. You did this. It it worked. Whatever like, you did going, worked. I'm going down with the ship. Oh uh, Lord, <clears throat> yeah. I built I built my ship and then I sank it. Uh, you know, you, you chose to be the captain and uh, you did what captains need to do. That's right. Assemble their ship while drunk <laughs> and sink it. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the last episode we left off, I had just tried to kill myself and I just came back to, uh, consciousness. Um, so like I ended with, you know, it takes years to build connections, establish routine and order, and only nine days to tank a business. I defaulted on all my credit cards. I defaulted on that predatory commercial loan. I stopped payments to all my suppliers, but I still made payroll. Well, my wife did for, for me. I was in the hospital and I couldn't do anything, but my wife wrote the checks. Uh, She actually, my wife is smart and she took all the money out of my business account so that uh, they couldn't take it. They could not take it. And she, we did borrow some money from family to make payroll. Um, And then she was like, okay, well we got to get money coming in. She was like, what work have you done? She, she came and visited me the first weekend and she was like, I just, she was like, I love you. You're alive. That's great. What work have you completed that we can bill for? And I just listed it all and she got a lot of money in payments and good on her. Yeah. She knocked it out of the park. I, I knew mean, she, she was impressive, but damn. Yeah. Um, she's awesome. I, I could not, I could not have gone, gotten through any of this without her. You she, got lucky, man. I, I owe, I owe, I owe my life to, uh, my friend, Sean, and I owe the recovery of my life to my wife. Um, so, in the hospital, uh, I did not want to do anything, uh, period. Like, I was done with life. Obviously, I tried to kill myself. Um, I, spent the, I spent the first night in the psychiatric hospital just sobbing in bed. I have never, I've broken down and sobbed before. I've never cried myself to sleep. Uh, that was the first. Um, the Seriously? Second, uh, yeah. Damn. I mean, do, I, no, don't get me wrong. During this period with my business, I would regularly just like stop working and start crying, but mm-hmm. going to bed. No, I just slept, never cried at night during. Interesting. I'm going to ask you this question and it's going to sound like I'm making fun of you, but have you cried yourself to sleep as an adult? What's your definition of adult? Cause people have different definitions. <laughs> you have the legal one and then you have, Oh, what do you know? You're actually doing adult things now. Yeah. That one is the answer. Yes. To both. Yeah, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, after some really, really hard breakups, it's happened. Okay. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna bullshit you. Um, and then, well, all, you are a sensitive, caring lover. Oh shucks, thanks. You wouldn't know, but you know, I appreciate you uh, giving me the. Um, but it also happened, really, probably the first couple of months into you meeting me with regarding work. Um, because we were in the midst of the, one of the heaviest hits of the pandemic, if you remember. Yep. And I oh. was not even emotionally, remotely emotionally ready to experience what we saw at the, at the hospital. Seeing bodies roll down the corridors in yellow bags, that, that'll hit you a little different. Yeah, I remember it's so weird working on a healthcare campus and not being like a healthcare worker. Um, because you feel somewhat like insulated from everything. And so, you know, you're watching the news and everything seems horrible and you're like, well, I work at a hospital. It's not that bad. And then it really hit home for me when I, I watched 
a nurse on the plaza just like 11 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I mean, just break down Mm -hmm. crying like on the, I mean, my heart broke for that lady. And it also hit, we, we went into, uh, the, um, hospital supply, you know, where they do Mm -hmm. the, the procurement. Yeah. And I, I had been in there before, like when I first started, our boss took us down there, took me down there and, you know, I met the people, you know, normal mm-hmm. office during the pandemic. And I mean, like, you know, a week or two into like, oh, shit, we can't get supplies. Mm-hmm. They had like scoured the earth for supplies. Yes, and it's the, um, it was insane. The procurement office was packed with shit they had pulled from God knows where. Mm-hmm. And I mean, boxes, supply everywhere. Like you could not see the desks. Not, they had they had no storage room for everything they had. Yeah, it was PP was it. Yeah. And that, yeah, we watched, oh Lord. And then we had, um, that project where we were on that neuro floor Mm -hmm. and we did that, um, med gas shutdown. That when, when that started going, I don't want to say South, um, but that, that really, cause it, it didn't go South, but when respiratory care pulled you and me aside, and said, this better be fucking worth it. <laughs> yeah. I was sitting there. I was like, oh, fuck. This is real. <laughs> yeah. This isn't just uh, a common like common thing anymore. It's shit's real right now. <laughs> yeah. So um, the listeners don't know healthcare constructed. So just real quickly, briefly, med gas in a hospital is, you know, every oxygen, nitrogen, vacuum, all that stuff. The lifeblood. The lifeblood of the hospital. And when you do construction... And you add a new room and you have to add this stuff. You have to shut off the gases to add valves and stuff to add the new stuff. And so one of our projects was on the neuro floor, which they had actually turned into uh, a COVID ICU floor. COVID neuro ICU. COVID neuro ICU. So all neurological patients who also had COVID. Um, and so typically when you do this, you know, you, if you shut off the oxygen, you have to provide oxygen tanks. And if you shut off the vac, the, the vacuum, you have to provide vacuum pumps. And so when we did this shutdown, there were, I forget how many rooms, 20 something rooms. Uh, it was 30 and I think we had 50 or 60 pumps. Yeah. So usually you would have one pump per patient, but these patients were on ECMO and Mm -hmm. ventilators and stuff. And so the number of ventilators nearly doubled and the amount of oxygen Mm -hmm. was absurd. It It was was a lot. So, I mean, we were running through bottles Yeah, in in like half the time we expected. Yeah. And respiratory care is a, is also a crucial part of the hospital infrastructure. And as everybody knows during COVID, everyone is short staffed. Respiratory care was no different. There were two people, two guys from respiratory care taking care of 30 patients with, 50 pumps and fuck knows how many bottles of oxygen. And one, and one thing I also want to add is almost every single patient was under contact precautions. Oh yeah. And isolation precautions. So these, so just so everybody also understands is when these precautions are in place, you have to not disrobe, but you have to put on a protective gown, mask, gloves, and then you have to put that on, check the patient, leave, um, take all this off, go to the next room and do it all over again. So they were having to do this as fast as they possibly could. Two guys, 30 patients. I cannot tell you how much respect I have for that team that morning. And the, the, the shutdown started with a valve that wouldn't close. Um, I believe it was, it was vacuum. It was vacuum that wouldn't close. So we have the plumber up above ceiling trying to close this valve and he's standing on a refrigerator, and I just hear him up there going, "Oh shit, oh fuck!" <laughs> and that's uh, when I walk around the he, corner. Yeah, and then he, Luke walks around the corner. He's like, well, "Everything all right?" And I'm very calm when things go bad. I'm just like, "We can't close the valve," and he's working on it. Mike's working on it, and um, you, you I start see making, my fucking face. Yeah, and then Luke's. In, I would in, like to point out this is like. A month and a half into the job. Yeah, and Luke's Luke's in kind of a tizzy. I wouldn't say a tizzy. Yeah, you were. I would definitely say it was overwhelming. Um, I inside, I'm like screaming, panicking. But you got Mike hanging out up above ceiling, cranking on this valve, 
And uh, God damn it, I get to fucking mouth. <laughs> you got damn it, and then you got the new kid just like trying to figure yeah. it out. And then uh, the respiratory care pulls me pulls this aside and says, "I really hope this is fucking worth it." And and all I can say is, it was worth it. I I, uh, well, I, I don't remember what I said to him, but I I think it was something like, "It we're gonna get done on time." I right? think you said, "God, I hope so." <laughs> I may ha- I may not have kept my cool then. Um, I wasn't, but. <laughs> But uh, it it all went fine. He got the valve clip in, in, in it. So, yeah. I mean, they uh, got it done. We got it done. No, also one thing before we move on is, and I know this is another tangent, but the nurses on that floor are some of the most, and, and this goes for every single um, nurse in our hospital pretty much, are in, absolutely incredible. Don't go sucking all the nurses' dicks, Luke. That's that's rude. Um, <laughs> one. <laughs> they they no, are incredible. No, but so... While you were, um, I think you ha- had handed this project off to me at this time, towards the end of it, because um, y'all kind of wanted to be like, can you survive? Um, that is accurate. We yeah. did throw you to the wolves. I'm pretty sure our boss was like, this kid's got to learn. Um, I saw the charge nurse. You remember her? She was mm-hmm. she was very calm, cool, collected. Did not give a shit. Yeah, she was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, once, uh, so she had a COVID patient code. And I can't remember if I told you the story or not, but she had a COVID patient code. Her nurses were prepping her to go in in the isolation helmet. You know, the positive air mask yeah. helmet thing. Um, so no, the patient was coding. Nobody was in the room because it was COVID patient, so on and so forth. She said, fuck it, and then ran in the room without a mask, any gloves or gown and everything and started CPR. That one was a badass. No, I loved her. She's literally the one that when we would tell her we had to do work, she'd be like, oh, whatever. She's like, oh, you got to shut, shut my stuff down? <laughs> How long is it going to be out? All right. Okay. Cool. God, what a good project. She, what trust, a, she trusted us to do our jobs. What a horrible time to work in healthcare. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> then we walked on, in, uh, we walked on, uh, what was the ninth floor? For that water shutdown when every single patient was under contact precaution. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I remember. Yeah, yeah, that was not good. Uh, we made it though, Luke. We got through it. Every and and that's we had a we weren't impacted it by all of this near as much as the nurses were. No, not no, not at all. We were not. I don't want to call us frontline workers by we're any not. means. We're 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 support staff. Yep. The, the nurses and the frontline workers were hit so much harder than us. Yep, that's it. We basically just got in the way. As a matter of fact, yeah. yes. Um. So that so COVID was the last time you cried yourself to sleep. I want to say truly yes. COVID was horrible. So back in the psychiatric hospital, I spent Sorry, the first night. Tangent. I love tangents. Uh, I spent the first night uh, sobbing in bed, and then and then I went to sleep. The second day during a group therapy lesson, uh, when they asked us to write down who we were in our heads, I just started crying. That that is a cruel question. Who am I? I am nobody. Nothing. I am a failure. In nine days of group therapy and medication mixing, I was put on a combination of antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and antipsychotics. And I have actually been on this combination for nearly five years and haven't missed a dose. It's one of the primary reasons I am doing so well today. I finally found a combination that worked. I want to I go back to that. You haven't missed a dose? Nope. How? I have really good insurance. That, not missing a dose. So you're talking about refilling a dose or are you talking about taking a dose taking a dose how in the world did you do that i miss a dose left and right no no no. this is to stay alive you'd be surprised what you can do when your survival instincts kick in that's valid yeah always getting refills always taking doses you don't even want to hear about my history on that now there actually was a change um i was taking uh the antidepressant uh trintelix which is relatively new um it is it does not have a uh, generic and it costs um oh i remember you told me about this one it, it's very expensive uh it is a, for a 30-day supply it is 300 dollars. that's absolutely that's i i have opinions on that and the other thing is because it's relatively new, you have to get pre-authorization from your insurance which for it they, to be covered. Which they probably won't do. Well, they will, um, but they won't renew it every year. So every year I'd have to go through the pre-authorization process. And that's a pain. That is a pain in the ass. And then the last time I, I went to get it, um, it got denied. 
just straight up denied. Yeah, something Pre-out that's been working yeah. for four years. Let's let's say no. Yeah. So they handed me my, my prescription and they said that'll be nine hundred dollars because I get thirty or a ninety day supply. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's crazy. You got to do the pre authorization. And they said, well, it's been denied. And I was like, it's never been denied. It, long story short, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, and so this is when I went through the list of all the antidepressants that I've been on before. And my psychiatrist is like, all right, we'll try Effexor. I think because Trintelix worked and these didn't, I think we'll try Effexor. And I was like, all right, fair enough. Uh, Effexor costs me, I think like $3 for a 90 day supply. That's it. That's it. And it works just as well, if not better than Trintelix. And I thought Trintelix was the only medicine that would work, but Effexor was amazing, is amazing. I still use it. Um, and that, that's, so that's one of the primary reasons that I'm still doing well today. But that does not get us through the last nearly five years. That does not tell you what I went through. Uh, my time in the hospital was me starting over in life. I had descended into the very depths of hell, and that's where I started. I could not even say my name. In the hospital, I experienced something I have never experienced before. I no longer felt like an outcast. I made friends in the hospital. I was outgoing and funny, and people liked talking to me. People trusted me. For some reason, they honestly, more people than I ever would have imagined, just told me their life stories. I didn't have to sell myself or sell anything. They told me about their trauma, and I listened. Did not judge anybody. They didn't trust the people in the hospital, the doctors and nurses. And I told them I understood, and I did understand. And they trusted me, and they told me. I liked them. I actually, one of my best friends today is a friend that I made in the hospital. Five years later, I still talk to her all the time. She's super cool. She better now. We're getting there. It's it's a journey, but yeah, she's progressing. So she's taking care of herself. Yeah, she's or doing at least a great trying job. to. Yep, she's doing a great job. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, in the hospital, uh, psychiatric hospital, it was the first time I felt like I belonged somewhere, and of course, it was at a fucking psychiatric hospital. Uh, in fact, um, actually, no, <laughs> shoot. Uh, now I'm going to tell you about my friend, uh, that I made in the hospital. Um, we still call each other. Um, usually when we're struggling, uh, we are in, e- we are in each other's support network. Um, she has a fascination with, um, Ted Bundy and the Netflix series on Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, big serial killer, gal. big serial killer gal. Uh, I think the Jeffrey Dahmer, doc- uh, I think the Jeffrey Dahmer series was the greatest thing to ever happen to her. Um, <laughs> She's also a uh, criminal justice major, which totally tracks. Uh, yeah, that does track. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, Luke, but sometimes when I tell stories, I get really flamboyant. I wouldn't necessarily call that flamboyant. All right, fair enough. Well, I maybe... Wait, we have different definitions. Probably. Maybe I don't get flamboyant with you, but when I get really into my stories, I get flamboyant, and she loves hearing them. Um, we can bullshit together, and then we can descend into a dark place, and for a few minutes uh, on the phone, neither of us feel like shit. She is a good person. And I met her in the psychiatric hospital. I will be the first and most enthusiastic person to tell you that my life today is nothing like it was on October 20th, 2018. First, let's talk about that debt. I owed, uh, are you ready for this? This is a breakdown of where I owed all this money. Do I, do I want to be ready? Uh, sure. Why not? I owed $21,000 to the IRS. Ooh, that's, that's the worst one. That's bad. It's not as bad as, as you think. Uh, we'll, we'll get into it in a minute. I owe $20,000 to the predatory lender, $20,000 to a personal friend, around $18,000 in credit cards, and another $20,000 to suppliers and subcontractors. I got sued by everyone except my personal friend, and that was a huge help. I just explained to him how everything was going with me, and he said, not to worry. He said, just check in in six months or a year and that see about making payments. Friend. He is a good man. He also refuses to accept interest on the <gasps> loan that I'm paying back. So I was sued a lot for all the money, and I've actually paid nearly all of it back. The IRS, gone. Predatory lender, gone. Um, 18000 in credit cards, gone. Twenty k to suppliers, gone. Um, in fact, the only money that I have left to pay is uh, about... 3000 to my friend and about another 3000 to one of the um, credit cards. Uh, so the IRS thing, here's why it wasn't, here's why it was bad and here's why it wasn't so bad. So the reason I owed money to the IRS see, is because I wasn't paying, you know how when the, you know when you get your check and it shows all the like the taxes that you yeah. take out? Well, see, since oh, you're not, no. since you're not paying those to the employee, employee because they're taxes, mm-hmm. it's like a discount right? You don't have to have that money in your account. 
right? Because you, you can pay what the employee is owed mm-hmm. after taxes, and it's like you are got a discount. So $21,000 of not paying um, trust fund uh, taxes, um, the IRS was like, yeah, you owe that money. Um, I'd be like, hey, bud, you weren't taking it out prior, so uh, <laughs> you we're going to have to get our little bit now. Yeah, you owe it now. Um, so, But the IRS is actually... A lot of people... Is the IRS um, more understanding than I think they are? Yeah. Um, it, it, the the only bad experience I had with the IRS was some lady answered the phone and she was talking about how much I owed. And she was like, why didn't you pay this? And I was like, I didn't have the money. And she was like, why did you keep these employees? And I was like, because I had to get the work done. And she was like if you couldn't afford to pay them, why did you have them? And I was like, I don't think you understand how being desperate works. Like I had jobs to perform and shit's got to get, shit's done, gotta get done. I'm not making enough money. I was like, you clearly don't get the idea of winging it. Like and she was not understanding, but the dude that was assigned to my case, uh, he was actually super cool. Um, and it takes months and months for the IRS to actually like get to the point where you can get a payment plan. Oh, and so you had some you had some leeway. I had a I had a lot of time to get all the other stuff sorted, um, like going to court. <laughs> to so, did you have to get your own lawyer and everything? I'm assuming. No, I didn't get a lawyer. When oh, you're su- you you represent yourself. No, when you're sued for debt, um, and <laughs> so here's what's funny for credit card debt. I don't know if you know this. When you default on a credit card, um, and they sue you for it, um, the credit card company itself they'll just hire a law firm. And they'll just give the law firm the name of all the people who yeah. defaulted. And so they'll give you a court date. It's like date. a collection agency. Yeah. So they'll give you a court date and you'll show up and there will be one lawyer for the credit card company or collection agency. And he'll just stand up there while the judge calls each name on his list because he's got like 30 people that have defaulted. So they're all at the court at the same time? No. Oh, no. So if you that don't. sucks for that lawyer. So if you don't show up to court. Uh, it defaults in the debtor in the yeah in the full amount in the full amount, and so I showed up to mine, and every every single time you know they credit card guy stands up, he's got his twenty names. Is so and so here? No default. So and so here? No default. So and so here? No default. Is Joe Love here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you made any effort to pay this? No. Do you intend to pay it? Yes. Can you talk with the lawyer out in the hallway? Yes. All right. Next is so and so here. Default, and then uh, so if I you, ever default, I need to go to court. Yeah, and then so I would go out in the hallway and I would talk to the the lawyer. Uh, I'd be like, "All right, so I owe this much. You know, I can't pay it all at once. Can I pay it over like twenty four months or thirty six mm-hmm. months?" And they're like, "Yeah," and they're sitting there like writing out like, "All right, we'll do this," and they write the number on the agreement form the the payment sheet or yeah. what the, you know, the legally binding document, yeah. they just fill in the numbers and then you sign it and then they go turn it into the judge. That's a, that's how you get a reasonable payment over a reasonable was period it, of time. Was it for a lesser amount or full? The full amount, but over a longer period of time, usually a, a quote unquote reasonable amount of time to pay off, you know, a credit card debt is like a year when you go to court and you are there and you can talk to the lawyer, they'll give you 24 to 36 months. Yeah. Like, was this a commercial time. credit card? Uh, yeah, these were, these were, um, so commercial they, terms are a little longer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, I had a really nice, um, American express card. It was stainless steel. It was so super you cool. the American express platinum. It was metal. It was cool. Very high credit limit on that. Um, most. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So high, another, high, high yearly cost too. Yeah. So, uh, another thing I did was 20 K to suppliers and subcontractors. I actually got out of a lot of that because uh, a lot of the reason that they kept coming after me was because I wouldn't back charge them. Um, so when they would come back and say, you owe us this, I, <laughs> I actually, I, um, I don't want to say I got out of it, but I finally stood up for myself. There was a, um, a glass shower door company that I owed like $6,000 to for a glass shower door. Here's the weird thing about construction and people, uh, business owners or whatever. They always say something like, yeah, I saw you on Facebook or I saw your you know, thing. Looks like you have a really nice family. I know you don't want to disappoint me. It's like, bro, this is fucking business. Don't, so, don't get my family involved in yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. You get my family involved in this. We'll get bit, we'll get dirty. And she said that and I was actually, I actually worked where we work now and she, I was in the parking garage and she called and she said that and I was like, 
you know what, lady? When your guy came out, he fucked up my brand new tile shower. I had to... I had to pay my tile guy to come back, tear out the tile because they drilled the holes wrong, mounting holes wrong. And so I had to take out the tile and redo. It's not that hard to mount a door. No, it it? is not. And then they got the size wrong. So they had to recut it. And I said, all right, listen, you cost me X thousand dollars in, uh, in tile repair. Mm -hmm. Um, blah, blah, blah. I said, do you really, do you really want to pursue this amount that I owe for the, the door? when you have caused just as much damage with your yeah. incompetent installer. I was like, I think what we need to do is just call it even because I, I will just back charge you for, for the tile work. Yeah. I said, I'll send you the invoice like today if you want. Mm -hmm. And I never heard back from her again. Easy enough. Yeah. Um, and some suppliers just like dropped it. <laughs> like, uh, there it's was like, Hey, we got enough volume. This isn't worth it. Yeah. There was a dumpster company that I was behind on like, I think two or three months. And so what, what thousand bucks? Yeah. Something like that. And the thing is I, I hadn't called them to pick up their dumpster. And <laughs> you still had it. I still had it. Um, you know, you always, is when I was like, yeah, I don't really have it. And they were like, well, we need our dumpster back. And I'm like, yeah, but I can't pay you to pick it up. And they're like, well, we need our fucking dumpster. And so they just came and got their dumpster and uh, I guess dropped it. And actually I had one. So the good thing about making connections in construction is you, you make good, con you make personal connections. Yeah. That's the interesting thing about construction is people think, think it's, it's different. Than business. It is. Yeah. Um, and there was actually an HVAC contractor that I worked with and he just a really good guy. I loved working with him. I actually sent out a letter. One of the things that my financial advisor counselor recommended that I do was send out a letter to everybody just telling, like, instead of declaring bankruptcy, go ahead and send a letter to all the creditors and let them know that you're going to need time to pay. Like get ahead of it. Yeah. And so I did. And when I sent him uh, the letter, he replied with an email saying, don't worry about the invoice. I think I owed him like three or $4,000. Seriously? That is a, not a small amount to just walk. I was very open in my letter. I explained the reason that I couldn't pay. And that's because I, I tried to kill myself and oh, didn't have the money. You went that deep? I did. I, I, was, I literally was starting over. Like when I got out of the hospital, I was like, fuck it. I'm not, getting, hi, not hiding anymore. Book. I was like, listen, you guys can keep calling me all that, but nobody's getting paid until I get all this sorted. And he replied to that letter, you know, just don't worry about it. Like I've enjoyed working with you. Let me know if I can help you. Good on him. And that uh, from day, from the first day that I met him, I just had this like gut feeling that like, this is a genuinely good person. The, I couldn't even bring myself to like reply to his email and I still haven't. And it just, I was overwhelmed with how uh, magnanimous he was. See that, 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 that gives me, that makes me feel a lot better about construction because so many people have this view of construction that just everybody's rough, um, rude, and, or at least that's how I viewed it when I was younger. And that's how my parents viewed it until I kind of opened them up to it. Not everybody's rude and, and is an ass. No. Not everybody's so serious. Everybody, it's. And the thing is, he. People were nice. He, he, he was the owner of the company. It was a real, it was a, it was not a huge company, but he definitely had, you know, a lot of trucks, a lot of employees, mm -hmm. you know, it was not insignificant to him. It was not insignificant to me. I mean, it was, it was a major, it was. He took the situation very yeah, seriously he and did. personally. That's that's the breakdown. Um, <clears throat> I was sued a lot for all the money, paid nearly all of it back. We went through all that. The financial advice I received from a public financial counselor, which means I did not pay for the service. Uh, this is this is the public financial counselors are free services in most cities uh, where people are struggling with debt can go and, and get help. Didn't even um, know this thing. It, it is a thing. Um, but the financial advice I got from her was probably not something you would expect. Uh, why would you claim bankruptcy when you can just get sued? That sounds fucking crazy, right? But I already explained how getting sued works. You just show up and work out your payment plan. Um, just like taking a nine day sabbatical in a mental hospital didn't cause any more damage to my life than just suffering through those nine days in the real world. It turns out that getting sued isn't any more stressful than not being able to pay in the first place. If you've never been sued, getting that first letter or getting served papers oh, it's at terrifying. your front door. Terrifying. I can only, I can only, I've never been sued, so I can only imagine, yeah. but I've watched enough, uh, some, law some, and order and all that. Somebody comes and finds where you live, someone you don't know. 
And I had moved like three times. They deliver a pizza to you? The, no, they just showed They showed up here. Like the, yeah. our apartment is hard to find. It's like back behind yeah. some stuff. Dude just showed up. Oh, they showed up here. Yeah. He was soaked in like Dracar Noir cologne. Like, oh. as, but he like serves me and he, th- th- by this time I had been served probably like half a dozen times or so. Mm-hmm. And he hands it to me and I'm like, ah, oh, who's this for? And he was like, I don't know. It says this. And I was like, oh, I think this is a uh, capital one credit card. And he was like, oh yeah, I guess so. And I was like, well, Hey, be careful when you're coming out of here. Cause you know, there's you know, just like bullshitting with the process server. <laughs> like, please tell me he's like, you, 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 uh, you Joe. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Yep. Congratulations. You've been served. And I was like, yeah, I figured you've all right. Do you know what happens when you get sued? You can settle. You can settle for a lump sum if you have cash, or you can settle for the full amount over time, Mm -hmm. and the collectors will stop calling. Some of the debt magically disappears because, surprise, some companies don't have the resources to sue. Uh, So I was sued a lot, and I closed my business. I was berated by an IRS agent, which I told you I never turned on. Oh, yeah. I never turned on my phone again after I got out of the hospital. Did I tell you that? I think you did. No, yeah, you did. I just cut contact entirely. With clients and everybody? Yep. I switched straight to email or snail mail. Hmm. Your your father, as a lawyer, should have taught you this. Um, the only way that you are required to communicate with anybody is through the postal service. Did, is, that, is that binding? Yep. So that's actually legal. They, they have no right to call you. They have no right to send you emails. They can only send you an email to your last, or they can only send you mail to your last known address. Interesting. They can serve you at your address. They can send you letters. Did not know that. Um, now that doesn't mean they, you know, if they can't find you, they can still sue you, right? They can put out a notice, whatever. But put in your local paper. Yeah. But so I got the phone calls to stop. I don't get phone calls anymore, partly because my phone number changed. But uh, yeah, it all it all stopped when I was like, n- no more emails, no more phone calls. You got to mail me. And most people who want their money. We'll go through with it. But whatever. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. I get it. Uh, I don't really want to hash out all the intricacies of why I failed in my business, but I did leave my business behind with a very bitter taste of capitalism in my mouth. I thought I had the tools and skills and knowledge to be successful, but I only wound up losing myself in the experience. There was no personal growth, no sense of accomplishment at any time. I built a whole fucking house. And when I was done, I was just like, thank fuck that's over with. Um, (laughs) I came to actually hate my customers and I started to resent successful people in the construction industry. I wanted others to fail. In reality, I just wanted everything to stop. The last five years have been a process. I started out in intensive outpatient therapy. That's like group therapy for suicidal people where I made more friends. I learned a lot of coping skills and I learned about my brain. After that, I went to individual therapy every weekend, then every other weekend and then once a month. Then I switched to a psychiatrist who specializes in addiction. I see him about every two to three months for medication management and sometimes to listen to me bitch about life. I'm kind of throwing a lot at you here without talking too in depth about my treatment. So let me back up a bit. First, let me say that absolutely none of this is professional advice or guidance on mental health. Call 911 if you're having a mental health crisis. That's right, 911. Better yet, have someone just drive you to a hospital and check yourself in. Because if you call 911, the cops will come and they're kind of dicks about it. So just go to the hospital. When they do a wellness check, uh, if you say that you've been uh, feeling suicidal, they will put you in the police car and take you to the hospital. No, yeah, they'll put you on a 72 hour hold. Yeah, that's their job. Uh, So what is a psychiatric hospital like? Well, it was amazing. It was the best thing ever. You cannot have shoelaces or belts, so you walk around in socks with your pants kind of falling down. Not too bad. You have a room with fixed furniture and no sharp edges or angles. You have a roommate who, honestly, pretty okay. My roommate had an encyclopedic knowledge of music, like all music. You name a band and he would give you detailed discographies and link the musicians to other bands and other discographies. He was wild. Uh, Okay, so there was breakfast, then group therapy, then personal time, then some kind of art therapy, then there was lunch, then there was a medical check-in and group therapy and personal time, then there was dinner, then there was nurse check-in and personal time. Every day. My toiletries were put together in a little plastic caddy. My meds were handed out at a nurse's station. We sat in the day room with blankets, and when it was warm enough, we sat outside in a high-walled atrium. Sometimes the sun came in and we laid in the grass. The whole time, in a world far away, my business was crumbling. My wife was distraught, and my family was coming together to help around our house. 
uh, you, I, I mentioned that we were renovating our house, doing stuff. My family actually came in and helped finish 90% of it. Yeah. Good on them. Uh, getting your mental health together, that is to say getting your shit together, looks selfish. It is removing yourself from your world, your obligations, your people, and focusing solely on yourself. But consider that my first day in the hospital, I couldn't even say who I was. And the wild part is that I found every therapy exercise we did absolutely fascinating. Drawing a picture of how I see myself, making a collage, listening to music, smelling essential oils, Luke, doing yoga, doing mindfulness, journaling. Everything we did, I did it 100%. And it wasn't some artificial, like, okay, let's knock this shit out and stop being crazy. It was, I mean, when I did a thing in the hospital, I just went with it. I did not have a goal. I didn't have any judgments. I didn't have a single thought. I just did exactly what they recommended and thought about it just a minute. One of the things uh, that we did was um, we listened to music and we had to select songs. I picked a Beastie Boys song. <laughs> Which one? Uh, you know, at this actually, I don't remember. Um, actually, it may have been uh, "You Got to Fight for Your Right to Party." Oh well, yeah. I, I like. I was like, <laughs> well, when you can, when you consider what the Beastie Boys are really fighting for, they're fighting is is the right to party intrinsic in all of us? Is something keeping us from partying? We have to ask. Just don't want to have a good time. We have to ask what exactly is the party. And who exactly controls those rights? That's that is like, deep. Yeah. Um, so what 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 songs represent the emotions of fear, confusion, mistrust, coming of age? Like you got to fight for your right to party. So when you do the song thing, you have to like really sit there and think about what the words to the songs mean and what they mean to you. And when they ask you to like draw a picture of how you see yourself, I'm not a good drawer. I have very negative uh, self image issues. I honestly don't think I could do that. It, it was rough. Um, but I, I did all the things. You went all with, in. I did. I did it without judgment and without resistance. Why? Probably because I had nothing else to do and everything else I had done in my life led me to a very dark place. So I was like, well, fuck it. None, nothing else worked. Maybe cutting up these old National Geographic magazines and gluing the pictures to a sheet of printer paper, maybe that'll help. Okay, I haven't made a collage. Who the fuck knows? Like 13. Listen, there is actually something really satisfying I about cutting up a magazine and then gluing all the pictures together into some other god-awful creation. Honestly, I could see that. God, it's so fun. Also, that question, who are you? That is such a loaded and un... I I hate that question. Because I don't even know... There's no way in hell I could answer that right now. The fact that they asked it in a psychiatric... (laughs) That makes it so much worse. That's that's somewhat like sadistic, right? Like, <laughs> really? let, let's ask all these batshit crazy people who they think they are. Who are you? I don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> who are any of us? If, if my healthcare professional asked me, who are you, Luke? I'd be like, can we come back to that in a couple months? <laughs> <laughs> when I know. Let's get through the nightly sobbings first. <laughs> then I'll tell you. I, I, can't, I can only focus on one thing at a time. <laughs> that is true. If you remember, <laughs> um, the the first realization that I came to about myself and perhaps about the world is that I cannot stop people from judging me. I cannot insulate myself from the opinions of others. I cannot stop the way that people will view me as a business owner if I don't pay my debts. I can't stop the way people will think about me if they hear that I actually really sucked at running a business. However, I can approach my own life without judgment. I can approach other people without judgment. I have always been open-minded, but not necessarily judgment-free. And this led to my next realization. If I do not have to be judgmental with others, then I do not have to be judgmental with myself. In fact, I get to be myself without judging myself. Sure, I fucked up an entire business that many people excel at, many people who are less educated than I am. But hey, I was overconfident and underexperienced. I lost a lot of money, but hey, I've never had a lot of money to begin with. I hurt my wife and nearly lost her and my daughter, but I now have the opportunity to cherish what I have, to appreciate it, and to rebuild those relationships and make them better because I can do better. And honestly, I don't think my marriage or my relationship with my daughter has ever been better. Not judging myself or others. What a concept, right, Luke? You judgmental piece of shit. I mean, that's, I, 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 I mean, yeah, I do judge people. 
Um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And I think that's the hardest thing. Are you being serious right now? Are you kidding me? Of course. I, of course I judge people. I mean, it's it's literally, it's it's the hardest thing I have to battle is trying to put aside all of your, I guess, assumptions about people um, and what you expect out of them. And I think that that might be the hardest, one of the hardest things I have to do. There was an avalanche of truths that followed this breakthrough. But this is where I have to digress again and tell you that this is only true for me. Mental health does not have a one-size-fits-all solution, nor do all diagnoses have the same causes or treatments. Depression caused by past emotional trauma, traumatic brain injury, and even just poor brain wiring all have wildly different treatment approaches. So, you know, I'm just giving you the rundown of what I went through. So, no judgment. It needs to be said that this experience put my wife through absolute hell, and for whatever reason, she stuck with me through the whole thing. She was a very good, very loving person. And there was a lot of shit that I got wrong. For one, a lot of the debt I incurred during the failure of my business, I had kept secret. So when I started getting sued for non-payment, a full reckoning of exactly how fucked we were was in order. Imagine $90,000 in debt that you don't know about. That is frightening. Uh, Thanks to my financial counselor, most communities have free financial counseling centers, I learned to just roll with it. You get the collection notices, you get served with court papers, you call and settle with a payment plan, you budget for the payment plan, you show up in court, you do the payment plan. It's, It's really all mundane after a while. I cannot count the number of process servers who came to my door. Each one of them I just kind of chatted with and thanked them for doing their job. But I'm getting off topic because the money was only part of the problem. Another part, something that led me to drinking heavily, something I didn't even know was weighing me down, was this thing about my father. And I covered that in a few episodes ago. I carried a lot of this shit with me. I carried it, repressed it, ignored it, and I never thought about it, any of this stuff with my father. My father has now been in prison for five years. He has 13 years left on his sentence. I haven't spoken to him this whole time. We were never close because he's a, he's always been a real piece of shit, a real fucking asshole, but there had never been any real reckoning. In therapy, I asked how I was supposed to forgive him for what he had done, and the best advice I've ever gotten from a therapist, she looked me dead in the eyes and said, why would you forgive him? I said, that's what you're supposed to do, right? To be a good person? And she said, no, that was bullshit. Some people don't get forgiveness. And with that came great freedom, but not resolution. Part of my personal therapy journey has been a continued pursuit of mindfulness. Sometimes yoga, stretching, exercise, basically not succumbing to the desire to lay and do nothing. Mindfulness is work. But another part of my personal therapy came in the form of writing out every single memory I had of my father. And you know what? I have no good memories of him. Every single memory that I can recall had something to do with him being an asshole. Every fucking one. Most of them aren't egregious. Some of them are. Some involve yelling and hitting and shaming. Others involve subtle humiliation. Uh, Luke, when I was in high school, uh, I had a laptop that my father gave me. It was an IBM ThinkPad. It had Windows 95 on it. It Center mouse. Oh, yeah. The little red mouse in the middle. Those things are awesome. It weighed 20 pounds. It was the best. I I kept a journal on there. Private thoughts. Personal. Oh, my no. Basic, just things that 15 year olds think about and write about. You know, knowing, getting, developing your personality, learning how you think about things. Knowing what I know, I know where this is going. Yeah. So one time, uh, my computer crashed and I needed my father to fix it. And so I brought it to his house and uh, he showed up at Thanksgiving. He gives me the computer back and then he proceeds to relay to the family the things that I had in my journal on my laptop. That piece of shit. That piece of shit. So Luke, this is kind of why this is kind of why I invited you to do this episode. So I wrote down every memory in a notebook and planned to have some sort of ritual to burn the entire thing when I hit five years sober and alive. It's taken me this long to bring this whole thing with my father to a reckoning. And you know what happened after I wrote all this down? I opened myself back up to my stepsister, who I had avoided for years because of the shame. I was ashamed of myself for not knowing, not protecting her from the abuse. That is a dark, black feeling deep in my chest. The practice of writing down every painful memory was like shining a light on that darkness. And as fucking cheesy as it sounds, that's what worked. I've since gotten better at reconnecting with my stepsister. We did that whole series of episodes with her, and we both texted after I published them. And we both said the same thing. I'm so glad that we did this together. I'm glad to hear that. It is no small matter that I know now this is what my father wanted to avoid all along. 
All of us talking together, knowing each other, becoming an actual family. Fuck that guy. This has been a huge digression, but this is all part of a theme. When I say I've been gone working on my mental health, you have to understand this is what working on it looks like. I took 10 months off from this podcast, and in that time, I went to my job every day acting like nothing was wrong, acting like I don't go home and take extended naps just to wake up, cook dinner, and go back to bed, acting like I don't give up on my interests and instead zone out to play Fallout 4, acting like I want to get out of bed every day. What suffered were the things that brought me joy. I had not been doing much research. I hadn't even been taking photographs. I had not been riding my bike or eating healthy meals or even working out. As far as depressive episodes go, this one has been mild but with serious consequences. As a person who creates, the last 10 months have been pretty stale. I have lost countless hours of personal productivity. Instead, I've been reduced to continued capital productivity. That means I just go to work and collect a paycheck. Now, I don't want to tell you your business, but this is completely fucking backwards. What would have given me joy would be the time and space to work on personal projects, a reclamation of my energies, a time to refocus, and taking a break from my regular Monday through Friday job. Only 20% of workers with major depressive disorder receive minimally adequate treatment. That means 80% of workers receive no treatment. And as I can attest, other studies show that productivity drops significantly with moderate to severe depression. In my case, I am an incredibly productive person, usually working on something for 12 to 14 hours a day. But I had been reduced to just 8 hours of unfulfilling productivity. That's a 33 to 43% reduction in productivity. Now, just to put that into context, what I'm saying here, Luke, is that I did my job for 8 hours a day. Normally, outside of work, I would work an additional four to six hours on personal projects. That's like standard for me. Not because I'm an overachiever, but because I just love doing stuff. I like to have my hands busy. You're not an idle person. Idle hands spend time at the genitals. I thought you were going to say idle (laughs) hands are the devil's playground. No, idle hands spend time at the genitals. Oh, okay. (laughs) Haven't heard that one. And I cannot be touching my genitals all day long Luke Uh, that that would be that would be an issue Luke you are not yourself when you're depressed and also you're not all of my problems are not solved I live in much better conditions than when I was a kid half my family lived in trailer parks or public housing like many Americans we seem to be in this weird cycle of never enough no matter how well we're doing in this family my family something always comes up financially that sets us back always we teeter on the edge of breaking even every month and overspending, and we are conservative with money. What I'm getting at is this. Life does not stop. Life persists, ceaselessly craving more of us each day, even when we have nothing left to give. We wake up every day to heed the call of time itself, plowing forward in sunrises and sunsets. We never get a break. Sometimes I stop what I'm doing and look at my wife or my daughter and I smile, or I just tell them that I love them because I still have them and they mean the world to me. My family is the only thing that truly matters, and because I got a second chance, I will never take that for granted again. That means I occupy two realities. One is a subterranean world of creeping depression. It is always just below the surface. Sometimes it unbalances my humors, and I have off days or off weeks or off months. But the other reality is the surface, where, Luke, you and I interact with the world every waking moment. I've learned to slough off most things that would normally drive up my anxiety or sink into a depression. I like telling people I have superpowers. Oh, Luke, have I told you this? My superpowers? What are they? One of them is being awake. I'm proud of you. If I don't take one of my medications, I cannot sleep, period. Do you know how I get through the... uh, Actually, I know. I remember you telling me this at one point. The way that I get through my long late night shutdowns is I just don't take my nighttime meds for the duration of that shutdown. Now, when I get home, I take it. That's not healthy. (laughs) When I get home, I take it and I go to sleep. Screw the sleep prior to the shutdown. Uh, I don't get tired. I can stay awake for days. The other superpower is being unflappable. Our job, Luke, is stressful to others. And me. (laughs) (laughs) Just me. (laughs) I still work in construction. My current (laughs) job is very technical and very detail-oriented. There are lots of crises every day. This morning, my day started at fucking 5.30 in the morning because somebody set off a fucking fire alarm at the children's hospital. Um, was, that, but, was, was that me? No, that was someone else. Uh, but I don't feel the crises. I acknowledge them, I understand them, and I solve them, but I don't absorb them. I don't bring it home with me. And if I do get a call at home, I do not let it enter my home in any other way than I just answered the phone. 
and at work I make it a point to be as calm as possible. I have been to hell and back, and honestly, nothing phases me now. I tell very few people about my past, about my failures, and my depression, not because it's a secret, but because I mark time now by that singular date, October 20th, 2018, the day I became a real person. This is not to glorify my experience in any way. No one should ever suffer with depression. No one should look at suicide as a viable option. And certainly you should never look at suicide as a way to start your life over. It simply isn't. Almost five years ago, I made a choice that completely changed the trajectory of my life. And today I am not the same person. The person I left behind was broken and I got the chance to become whole. So I don't like to talk about that person because he had nothing figured out. He was in over his head and scared. And I don't identify with that person anymore. Today, my depression is manageable, but only because I went in 100% and used all the tools given to me in treatment, whether or not they worked. I use what works, and I appreciate the experience of learning what doesn't. So there you go, Luke. I've opened up to you, <laughs> I've opened up to you in a way that I do with few people. I love that I get to make this podcast. I love that my life now has the time and space for me to pursue hobbies that I love, and I love that the people that do listen to this podcast, I do love that they listen. I'm in a better place now, and I look forward to getting back to more regular episodes. Luke and I specifically chose to do this episode with you because you and I have talked about mental health in the past, and uh, really I wanted to express how much I appreciate, um, on a personal level, your willingness to talk to me about it. And I felt like this would be a good way to express my gratitude uh, just on a personal level. Now, on a professional level, I find you absolutely insufferable. Oh, I... Trust me, it goes both ways, man. <laughs> but on a personal level, this is uh, sort of my tribute to you, uh, me saying thank you for being being a person who can actually talk about their mental health. And, and I appreciate that because at one point, no way in hell, three or four years ago, would I have ever talked about my mental health to somebody, especially a coworker. Hell, I didn't even talk to my family about it until three years ago. Uh, wh- what did you say to him? Um... Well, uh, the time I was driving to work and it kind of hit me at that point, um, I called my friend, she talked me like, didn't talk me down, but like kind of talked me through what I was feeling. Then I called my sister and she, she was like, this is exactly how I felt when I was an accountant at Raymond James. I was burnt out. I hated my life. I hated my job. I hated everything. So at that point she handled it perfectly about as good as anybody could have. And when she started when she kind of walked me through exactly what I was feeling, exactly what it was, she quite literally just, you know, I was in my car sitting in front of a job site, <laughs> staring at our superintendent. <laughs> and she's like, Luke, this is burnout. You need to just go in, do today, call off tomorrow if you need to. Um, and at that point I called my mother. So she was still working in the hospital at the time. Um, and she said, okay, I'll set you up with one of my friends who's a nurse, pra- nurse practitioner. Um, we'll get this handled. Don't worry about it. Um, so initially they handled it really well. Um, later on when I started to kind of like withdraw a little bit and that's when they started pushing and getting angry cause I was withdrawing, <laughs> you know, as one does. Yeah. Your, your family doesn't take kindly to that when they, when they help you and then you're like, Ooh, I'm going to, I'm just like, I'll this handle this alone. Yeah. They don't this, like that. This is not your issue anymore. This is no. mine. See, but that's um, how you know you have a good support network. Yeah. And then, uh, I kind of one, one Christmas, I, in front of my sister and my brother-in-law, uh, my mother and my father, I kind of broke down and just opened up to him and told him exactly what was going on and why sometimes I just don't want to talk about it. So I'm wondering, you like to be outside. Yeah, I do. I love to be outside. You like trees and stuff. Big tree guy. In fact, I've been listening to a book. I forgot who it's by. I'll have to look that up in a second called The Secret Life of Trees. Oh, okay. It's amazing. Uh, have you had a chance to look at the Bill Bryson book? How do I answer this properly? You can say no. I have not. Okay. Well, I look, I, I do apologize. No, you don't have because you gave that to me like a week ago. I meant to read it when I was. I don't expect everybody to read the first book that I give them. Um, no, I just when when you start to read it, I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts. So the reason I mentioned that the is Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wolben. You're listening to it. Are you listening to it on Libby? Uh, I bought it on Apple Books. Ooh, nice. Because I needed to download it for the trail. Ah. So let's talk about that, the old trail. The, the, the trail. <laughs> what are you doing with your life right now outside of work? Uh, well, I'm in the process of uh, walking 2,200 miles. <laughs> 
aren't we all doing that, Luke, in our lives, just walking arbitrary numbers of miles? Well, you and I walk way too much on a normal basis. Why are you walking 2,200 miles, Luke? Because I thought it would be fun. Is that and like, then I figured out that it's a lot more than fun. <laughs> is that a specific length of something? Oh, it's the Appalachian Trail. Oh, yeah. I see. I get it. So you you have taken on the um, the noble pursuit of hiking one of America's greatest treasures, nat- natural treasures. Yes, the Appalachian Trail that goes from somewhere bumfuck Georgia to bumfuck Georgia to bumfuck Maine. That's right. Uh, so you go from the 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 deep south of the deep south to the deep south of the far north. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. You go from country to uh, northern country. Now, obviously, you're not on the trail right now. But Unfortunately you're, not. But you're still in the middle of doing the Appalachian Trail. Yes, so I'm 318 miles in. So the way that you're doing this is you're taking time off of work. You're flying, driving, hitchhiking, sucking your way to wherever trailhead you got to go. Pretty much. <laughs> and I then you got, I haven't resorted to sucking yet, but you know, you could get desperate. You never know. <laughs> you you never know what you do for the AT, baby. <laughs> you got to get back to town somehow. <laughs> I got to get that resupply. <laughs> I see a flatbed and a lonely trucker. This guy, <laughs> this guy is taking me home. <laughs> Sir, can you take me to the grocery store? I need more ramen, please. <laughs> I need beans. <laughs> and what you'll do for beans. <laughs> so you take time off work. You schedule these trips out to the woods and you hike mm-hmm. long distances. Yes. Last and one was 195 miles over 12 days. And you've hiked 300, how 18 many? this year. 318 this Not year. Not including like weekend trips on trail. So I have to ask you this. What do you get out of it? To put it bluntly, a sense of simplicity. Okay. You, you no longer have to worry about your phone. Well, actually, I, I do because I use something called, used to be called Gut Hook, but it's essentially like that was trail name of the guy who made it. It's now called Far Out. Um, oh, good. That Far Out is a much better name than Gut Hook. I don't think you realize how pissed off the trail community is um, that it's now called Far Out other than Gut Hook. Um, also, to be fair, uh, you did fucking call me from the trail to ask about work. I've never been more pissed off. At yeah, you. I know. I got that tone. I got a call from one of our directors of one of the units I work in where I, I have a project that's adjacent to. And he's like, Luke, we got a problem. And I was like, oh, shit, I knew I shouldn't have turned on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you. There's too much tree, too many tree. And I was like, uh, sir, um, I'm in the middle of climbing a mountain right now. Um, I might not have service. <laughs> Um, I'm in a real pickle here, guys. So, uh, and he could hear me breathing freaking heavy because I had my headphones in because I, t- <laughs> I needed, I needed to book a reservation for a hostel to the town I was coming into. Um, he's like, we got an issue. And I was like, okay, I'll call Joseph. <laughs> I was like, he'll be able to handle it for you. <laughs> and he's like, where are you? And I was like, I'm in the middle of climbing in the mountain on the Appalachian Trail. And he's like, damn it. You're lucky. <laughs> my problem is insignificant now when there's mountains out there to be yeah, climbing pretty much. Um, no, but you know what the funny thing is that also happened to me back in, um, when I did it last time I turned on my oh. phone for five minutes. Mm. Guess who called me? Jake. Oh God. <laughs> He's like, we need you. And I was like, I'm in the middle of something. <laughs> <laughs> he ended up busy. Um, so like, I, call, call me back in 10 minutes <laughs> and then you got no service. <laughs> As I go back into the gully, just, just straight to voicemail. Um, so I mean, long story short, it's, it's a really st- you get back to the most simple of things. The goal of the day, and the, and you really live by the day. You wake up. I generally woke up about 5, 5.30 before, before the sunrise. You wake up. You eat. You find water. You hike. You find more water. You eat. Find more water. Go to sleep. And you repeat that for as many days as you're out there. Um, some days you might go t- into town. Um and it gets a little bit more complicated. It gets kind of nice when you get into town because um, you have AC, you have food. You can go get you can go get drunk. Because <laughs> yeah, that's what I did in Hot Springs. <laughs> to be fair, you can get drunk on the trail too, but I imagine it's not as fun. Uh, no, it's so much more fun. <laughs> um, it's just a lot more weight that you don't want to carry. I'm not. I'm not going to carry a freaking fifth of liquor in or a 
six pack. See, that's why you take the dried shrooms. Mm-hmm. A lot of people. So when I when I hiked with the through hiker bubble back in March, everybody was tripping acid. Everybody was microdosing. Some people were tripping. Oh, some people were seeing God. <laughs> some people were seeing dragons, man. So the reason I the re- I'm I'm trying to pry you into you using the Appalachian Trail as a as a form of uh, mm, therapy. therapy. So it's a hundred percent. So when I yeah, I probably told you this when I did it in March, uh, I ran into a bunch of wounded warrior vets. No, you did not tell me this. And there was a group I forgot what it was called. I'll have to look back at my pictures because I think I took a picture of their um, group logo. That these outdoor companies like outdoor um, outdoor research. Um, Jet Ball and everybody, they sponsor them. They'll pay them a stipend, like a weekly stipend or a monthly stipend to go hike the trail, kit them out in all this gear. And they're doing a supported hike all the way through from Springer Mountain to Katahdin. Um, and that's just one of the many groups you can do. So, and then I also ran into one guy um, that I hiked with pretty much since day two. His name, his name was Swayze. That was his, uh, I want to say it was call sign in the military. And he had been through... He'd been held back. He'd gone bankrupt. He had lost his kid. He had been in and out of rehab. Got went had a drinking issue. Had a heroin issue. Had um, an issue with uh, marijuana. I mean, it's so on and so forth. And he his reason for hiking was he's like, if I don't get my shit straight, I'm gonna die and lose my child for good. Um, he said, I'm hiking myself sane, and that's what a lot of vets use the trail for. Is there's the the term called hiking yourself sane because after so long in after so long without all the stimuli of our current culture, it's you kind of like do it like a soft or hard reboot. Um, and that's another reason why I go is cause I can get away from all the stimuli at work. Um, because I mean, you, you've seen during this podcast, <laughs> I'm routinely checking my phone. Anytime I get a buzz, it's not, because I'm afraid or not, it's not a fear, but I'm like concerned. Is it, is it going to be work? Is it an email that needs to be answered or what is it? Um, and while I'm out there, I don't give a shit about that. I put on my out of office email and I'm just like, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> I'll get back. To, I'll get back to the thousand emails I missed <laughs> in three weeks. Every, every time you get signal. Oh, look, a hundred more emails. Hmm. Whoops. I, I, I checked my email once. Oh Lord! Good and for I you. went into a mild panic attack on trail. I was like, "Not gonna do that again." Deleted the app. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please tell me you really deleted yeah. the Outlook app. So oh my you know God! How uh, I have it set up on my home screen to where it shows my daily calendar. You know how you can do that mm-hmm. block where it shows your day, daily calendar. I deleted that, and then I deleted the app. Good for you. Because I was sitting there, I was like, "I know myself. I'll check this every freaking day. I'll check this every day." I also didn't want reminders. The the people that I've met, because I, I, I have not in any way, shape, or form hiked as much of the AT as you, but when I worked at the summer camp, I mm-hmm. did have the um, off-site program, and I made it a point to take the kids to do, I think, like 10 or 15 miles of the AT just so they could yeah. say they hiked it. Yeah. And so it was always like, you know, you started a shelter, ended a mm-hmm. shelter, and then come back. Yeah. But then last year, you let me borrow your gear, and I took a trip and always 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 the people who are the the more the the most open or easygoing mm-hmm. open-minded gentle mm-hmm. just accepting. They're, they're, the the more accepting the, the most accepting people out there are usually the people who are going through their own shit and trying mm-hmm. to sort it out it's it's that and then the trail community as itself if you were through hiking if you're through hiking a long trail so that's the condom divide trail cdt that's from Arizona all the way up to Canada um, or the PCT that's from Baja Mexico all the way up into Canada which is the Pacific Coast Trail um, then the AT from Spring around the Maine those are the American through the three main American through trails if you're doing that you've given up a lot mm-hmm. and I do mean a lot because you've generally either you're between jobs you've left your job or your job gave you a hiatus and you're gonna be without health care so that's a big piece too um, and then you've also made this commitment to yourself that I now have a decent bit of money online because these tr- it's not cheap to hike a through trail because you're it's six months you have to figure out how to feed yourself and stay on trail for six months. Um, the average cost of hiking one of these trails or at least the AT it's about six grand six to ten grand depending on how nice you want to live it. 
Um, you can hike it cheaper, obviously, if you want to live off ramen and canned stew, so on and so forth. But it's not cheap. But some of these these people are all in, and then when you're on the trail, it's just part of my French. But they don't give a fuck. They're just like, "You're weird. Come on, I'm weird too." Like you know me. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm a I'm a quirky guy. Let's put it kindly. <laughs> you are as straight laced as they come. Oh, shucks, thanks, guy. My my dad would be pleased to hear that. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, you can just be weird. It's great because you can walk up to a random guy and be like, "I'm I'm Luke." Well, in my case, it'd be like, hey, I'm Trademark. Is that your trail name? Yeah. Your trail name is Trademark. Yes. I don't know why, but that is fucking perfect. Yeah. You are fucking Trademark. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Okay, I trust you about a lot more stuff now. So That is solid judgment on your part. And you just, you kind of immediately hop in. And everybody's so protective of one another, too. If somebody's struggling, they'll check in with you. They care for you. And then if you're hiking and you're slowing down, they'll be like, hey, trademark, you good? And if you say no, they're going to stay with you. If you say yes, they're going to be like, okay, you hike your own hike. We'll see you at camp. And then I've been in a scenario where, oh, Swayze didn't meet us at camp. He was three miles behind us. Zen, grab your shit. Let's go. And we'll either tear up our tents and go back or sl- empty all our stuff with the person that's at camp and go get them. So it's stuff like that. We truly care for one another. And then we also had um, the Tramley that I was with my first time in March. That's trail family. Um, I know you're smirking. Um, there was a guy that was just really freaking weird and not in a good way. It's not quirky weird. He was like, eh. um, Made people uncomfortable? Yeah. He made the women uncomfortable. Uh, um, all the guys noticed that. And we all kind of like started shunning him out. Like it's not like the informal of like not including him stuff. And you eventually got the picture. It's not rude. It's we're not, we weren't aggressive with it, but we all kind of like realized and it's like, we're not going to accept this. So it's, you don't know anything about these people. You know what they're like on trail. You know a little bit about their backstory, but you truly know what's all wrong inside their head because everybody's fucking talking about it. So you mentioned the hard reset do using the trail as a hard reset i hadn't planned to take it here but as you're talking and as you said that i realize so my hard reset was the psychiatric hospital Mm -hmm. and that's literally what i called it yeah um to and this annoys my wife to no end because when she's struggling i'm like sounds like you need a hard reset (laughs) joe i'm not going to the fucking psych ward (laughs) i'm not laughing at that but god damn so here's here's what happened when i came home from the psych hospital i I mentioned that all my toiletries were in a caddy Mm -hmm. and when I came home, uh, you know, I had told my wife, I don't, all I have to, I don't have to do anything. I wake up, I take my caddy, I shower, I go to breakfast. I was like, I don't have to think about anything. Like I know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that she did to help when I came home was she got me a shower caddy. That's adorable. And I mean, it like, that's what I needed. Like, listen, so she worked on campus yeah. and I would come to campus with her cause I wasn't going to be alone. Yeah. And I was that was before you yeah before I worked there and I would just like wait for her like I would sit in the lobby of uh one of the buildings and just like I would you know listen to music all day for eight hours like walk around minimally functional could not do a whole lot of stuff okay um and the shower caddy thing helped it really got to the point where I, I needed this structure of like you needed like a routine type yeah yeah just to get back to like being a human what I'm here, I'm drawing parallels between the psychiatric hospital where it's the same thing. Like you're in the hospital, you're all in the same position. You know, you're all fucked up. Mm -hmm. There's going to be one person who's like, we don't want anything to do with that person. Yeah. And those people drop out in the first 30 miles or the first. So the statement, there's two statements, get the fuck out of Georgia. That's the hardest. That's one of the hardest parts because Georgia's a bitch. And you lose people. Sorry to like get off your topic. And then also get the hell out of the Smokies. Ah. Uh. Because <laughs> the Smokies also drop people. So once you get past, once you get north of Hot Springs, which is about 300 miles in, uh, yeah, get roughly 300, maybe like 280. Um, you're, you're gonna, you're, you're sitting pretty. You've, you've dealt with a lot. You've dealt with a shit ton of pain. You've struggled. You've contemplated quitting every single fucking night. <laughs> 
and when you wake up in the morning and you look at your feet and they're bleeding um or your your uh, calluses and blisters are wide torn wide open or whatever it is your back feels like hell your feet hurt you're cold <laughs> you're wet and you just you're like well let's do it <laughs> the the parallel i'm i'm drawing here is um it's not it's not the same but it's exactly the same it's withdrawing from society having that time away like completely away Mm -hmm. in an insulated kind of environment with people who are in the same boat Mm -hmm. no quite literally everybody's in this everybody's in it together it feels it makes sense when you're on the trail right why you're doing it? No, you personally. It makes sense when you're on the. You, you feel like yourself. I feel at peace. Yes. I, there's there's there the stress that you're getting is physical, and then some a little bit of fear, because you're sitting there. It's like, well, if I hurt myself, I'm kind of screwed right now. Um, or like, where's my next water? It's it's very primitive. Yeah. It's a primitive kind of fear. So your body just kind of reverts to what it needs. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You're, you're not doing something for somebody else. And you have such a routine. Kind of back to your thing. You wake up, you take your shower caddy, you go shower, and you go to breakfast. Every day is not the same, but every day is kind of the same. It's it's funny that you're able to do this. Well, and not funny. Here, here's, the, here's the thing. If I realized I could deal with my mental health issues in a healthy way earlier... Because mm-hmm. I always knew that I, I love being outside. I love riding my bike. I love yeah. doing all this stuff. It never, it never ever clicked to me that like these are the things that I should be doing regularly for my mental health. And it wasn't until I was hospitalized that, and I'm going to bring two things together. So last year you let me borrow your stuff and take a hike. I hiked, what, three days? Something like that. Three or four in the Smokies or something like that. And it sounded amazing. Something that I hadn't done in a long time and I missed it. And, but there was that sense of familiarity that I, hadn't felt since the psychiatric hospital which was wake up make breakfast put your shit together put your shit on your back start walking yeah do all filter that shit. it and go and then, it's so simple and then get to your next checkpoint or your next campsite and the funny thing is is i didn't make the connection in the psych hospital but i made it after when i went on that trip that that was what i liked about all the other activities that I've done, mm-hmm. like doing the um, the adventure program for the summer camp, doing cycling, like training makes sense. You you it's very regimented, and it's I'm not saying that you know everybody benefits from like rigid structures. That's certainly not the case. I I couldn't agree more. But it is to say that as humans, we recognize we we know the behaviors and the activities that benefit us, that make Mm -hmm. us feel the best. We don't always make the connections that those things, the reason that we engage in them, that we pursue them is because they help bring us back to that almost like a hard reset area. Yeah, It helps center us. It it makes it, I don't want to say everybody needs a simple lifestyle, but in today's world, you need to get away and get simple. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it, especially in our jobs, it's everything's an emergency. Go, oh. go, 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 go. And that's not even to say like everybody needs to go hiking. No, I, mean, I, I everyone, I, everyone would benefit from it. No, but nobody needs to be a hiker. No. And I, and I, I, I kind of mean that because I like the trails to myself. You need to go hiking, but don't go hiking. Listen, there's enough national and state parks for everybody to hike a little bit, just a little. Not all the time. No, everybody needs to go. I, I think everybody does need to live be outside more, though. Be outside more. And that's more. true. And that's an honest opinion. But the the other thing that I get into a lot when talking about like mental health is I, I harp on mindfulness a lot. Mm-hmm. And not everybody's down with it. It's, you know. It's so hard. It is hard. But th- this kind of goes back to being in a psych hospital, hiking, doing mm-hmm. that. Hiking is a one long, continuous mindfulness exercise you can make it one long mindful mindfulness experiment um if you want to but that you will drive yourself insane i did it for an entire day on my my last most recent 12 day trip and i was like i can't do this so what i did is i did every the first two to three hours of every every single day 
um, no headphones, no phone, um, no podcast, nothing. The only thing I could look at my phone was for was the map and to make sure I didn't pass my last water source. Oh, that's so interesting because when I did my hiking thing, I never listened to anything. I didn't, did not have my phone out. I had my camera with me and I took some yeah. photos, but like it was I, like just walking and listening was like all I, I did not want to hear yeah. anything. So it, oh, it, oh, go sorry. ahead. No. And the water, when there's a water feature and there's running water. Oh, I the take fact that headphones like, out. Oh yeah. No, no sure. questions asked. Well, especially in the summer and during, well, I went in September, late September, October. Um, I finished the first week of October and that's bear season, baby. <laughs> You don't hang around water sources without oh, okay. with your headphones in during bear season because the, that's their territory. <laughs> As I said, bear, we both looked at Joseph's dog. She's a very aggressive beagle. Um, how do you want to wrap this up, Luke? Do you feel like we've made? Do you feel like we've tied in our connections? I, I feel we we've definitely learned a lot about each other. I'll tell you that. Is there anything you want to add? Um, I think everybody needs to definitely give themselves more grace and more understanding and kind of like you need to expect something out of yourself but i think everybody a lot of people hold themselves to way too high of a bar i think and mentally i should say i think the the takeaway and i already said it in the in the script but the thing that i come back to is you know you can't stop others from judging you that's impossible but you can one not judge others that's hard to do but the hardest thing to do is to not be judgmental about yourself, but that's also the kindest thing that you can do. Mm-hmm. No, I couldn't agree more. I, th- I think doing that for me has been a very liberating experience, like a daily practice of, okay, I, I don't have enough money saved up in my retirement. All right, but I'm trying. Yeah. Okay. I really fucked up this business, but I'm trying, but I am working on it still. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was not the best husband. I'm doing the best I can now. I wasn't always there for my daughter. I, I am now. I take time off. I didn't always take time off for myself. I never really cared about myself. I do now. That's the, the depression is, like I say, a focus on the past. It is manageable when you allow yourself, the, like you say, the grace to look back and say, okay, yeah, all that happened. But today, today I am not there. Today I will not return there. It doesn't mean anything in the past didn't happen or that it's insignificant. It's yeah. all very significant. And I think that a big part of that too is acceptance. Yeah. At least in my opinion, personally, that's probably the one of the hardest things I can come by is accepting what happened and in a way moving on to give yourself yeah, the ability to cope and get better. Cuz I'll be honest, I I don't think about that day, October 20th, 2018, I don't think about it all the mm-hmm. time. And sometimes I feel guilty because I'm like, oh, I really should think. That. I don't think that all the time. Mm-hmm. What I do think, though, is I've been alive for this long. I've been sober for this long. I'm way better now than I was then. And I know that I can keep doing better. But I don't think about that day. That day was a horrible day. So you don't ruminate on that day anymore. I don't. And, but it's not like I avoid thinking about that day. Yeah, I just... I've come to terms with that day for what it is. It certainly has impacted where I am now, obviously. Mm-hmm. I give myself the grace to admit that I was, I was fucked up. I didn't, I had no, I had no help. I had no, I had mm-hmm. no idea how to deal with any of it. And, and, and so something else I'd like to add is I don't think enough people let others in. Yeah, that's a big thing too. Because the first step to, at least in my experience, was to say, oh shit, I can't do this alone. <laughs> That is hard, nearly impossible for some people to say. Yeah, because I can already tell you, I very well might not be alive without my friends, my sister, and my mother. Because my mother's the one that set me up with the nurse practitioner, and my sister told me exactly what was going on. My friend talked me off the ledge in the sense of how I was feeling. I think the support system, support network, is something that we people need to be more conscious of or mindful of. If, if you don't have those people... Mm-hmm. You do have those people. You just don't realize it. And I'll be honest. I think part of that starts with young, um, early childhood education too. As far as um, teaching them what to look out for, uh-huh. teaching them what a support system looks like, and from what I'm being told, that's starting to be in, incorporated into education. So I think that's Im- I think that's super important, and I I think it's uh, plenty of my other episodes are political, so I won't get in. I don't want to get, get into the politics side of this, but I will say that we do. We do children a disservice 
by not acknowledging or validating their very real feelings and, and not mm-hmm. just not just anger. You can't just say, oh, you're you're 13, you're angry and sad. Yeah, that's that's bullshit because no. that's what I was told. I was like, oh, you're 13, you're angry. I was like, okay, cool. I'm an angry 13 year old. Well, you know, we didn't get into this and maybe it's for another podcast, but you, the anger is one of my things. Oh my gosh. It's, it's especially in the mail. <laughs> this was like a revelation when, um, we're going through like the feelings, uh, anger is a, um, it's a mask. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. A- anger is the easiest go to emotion for a lot of people. And it's because it is it is hiding a bunch of other emotions below it. Anger comes from all the other emotions: fear, jealousy, inadequacy. You, all the other emotions are below anger. We, as humans, do ourselves a disservice to say, "I'm so fucking mad." You should explore why you're mad. I'm mad because it's fucking stupid. Like, no, there's other stuff below. I that. can't tell you how many times I've come into your office and like I'm pissed off and you're like why and i was like i don't fucking know (laughs) it almost feels like in in society in general it feels more acceptable for a man to be angry 100 percent, than for a man to be afraid or insecure it's it's the whole bravado thing i guess what i'm saying is it's important to talk to kids about their feelings and not hide behind anger I couldn't agree more because I wasn't talked about my feelings until I was like 14. It's also important not to make a joke about everything, fuckface. Yeah, that's true. But if you didn't notice, I use my jokes to hide behind <laughs> a lot more too, bud. <laughs> and they're all and all the jokes are pretty bad. <laughs> the jokes are bad. My depression is worse. <laughs> Luke, your jokes are terrible. If you're suffering from mental health issues, there are a ton of free resources available to you. You don't need insurance to join local support or therapy groups. There are online chats and groups that are free and open to join. My experience has been different. I can't make any specific recommendations on services. All I can advise is that if you know you need help, you know. And yes, it is available. You can text 988 for the Suicide Prevention Lifeline or go to 988lifeline.org for help. <laughs>